All right, thank you all for having me. Um, it's been a great visit so far. Uh, so I work on simulations of core collapse supernovae. Um, and usually I work on sort of the obscure theory side of things. But I'm going to talk today about some work I've been doing on what we can actually learn from observations of a core collapse supernovae using our simulations. Um, so what we can do to predict and constrain our models uh, with uh, future observations. Uh, to start out with the sort of the very fundamental basics, what is a core collapse supernovae? So we have our massive star, which starts out as this giant ball of hydrogen. And it starts burning that hydrogen into helium, and eventually the helium into carbon, and so on and so forth through these heavier nuclear elements until we end up with our sort of typical Astro 101 onion star, um, where we now have sort of layers of nuclear burning going on throughout the star. Uh, and we're burning silicon in a shell uh, into iron and nickel um, in the core. However, it's not energetically favorable to keep burning iron and nickel. Um, so we're sort of left here at this dead end, where the, the star can no longer produce energy from nuclear burning, um, but it needs to support itself against, under, against gravitational collapse. Um, and that support comes from electron degeneracy pressure. So this is the same sort of idea as a white dwarf, um, where we're using electron degeneracy pressure to stabilize against gravi the gravitational pull. But that can only stabilize so much mass. Um, so we end up with this sort of upper mass limit uh, for our, the core of this star of about 1.48 solar masses. Um, but we're continuing to burn more and more silicon. So eventually through the star's uh, lifetime, it'll reach a point where this iron nickel core reaches that 1.48 solar mass limit, and we no longer have the support against gravitational collapse. And that's where we get the core collapse part of the core collapse supernovae. So I'm going to step through this process in, in sort of uh, slow motion so we can talk about what the core collapse supernova mechanism is. Uh, these figures are going to show on the y-axis here, this is the radius. Uh, and the scale will change. So we're going to start out with about a 3,000 kilometer uh, iron core. Uh, the x-axis here shows the mass. So this is in mass units. And we're starting out with about a 1.48 solar mass uh, iron core. This upper octant shows the fluid motion. So this is going to be what directions the, the material is flowing and what, where the, the matter is flowing. This lower octant is going to show the, the matter composition. So we're starting out with iron and nickel. And I'll show, also show you what the neutrinos are doing. And you'll see a time scale up here. Um, just below this little title. And so we're starting at sort of t equals 0, the mo moment of core collapse. And so our, our iron nickel core is beginning to, to fall inwards. Um, and it's starting to, and it cools via the emission of neutrinos. Um, and now, very, very quickly, so about 0.1 seconds later, the very center of this core has reached 10 to the 12 grams per centimeter cubed. Um, and this is the point where neutrinos become trapped. So we're producing neutrinos at, as this core collapse continues, because we get electrons in the material are capturing on the nuclei and undergoing sort of an inverse beta decay process, um, which is producing electron neutrinos. But these densities are so high that the neutrinos are actually trapped and have to sort of random walk their way out. Um, and yeah, random walk their way out. So we're producing a lot of neutrinos. Some of them are being emitted, but for the most part, they're trapped in this very, very dense material uh, within about 0.1 seconds of the core collapse. So about 0.11 seconds later, um, we've now reached the point where the central part of this iron nickel core has reached nuclear matter density. So this is basically the, the density of an atomic nucleus, uh, but over about 0.8 solar masses of material. So we just have a giant atomic nucleus uh, that's cooling via neutrinos. But again, the neutrinos are trapped, so they're random walking their way out. Now this material in here is no longer a nuclei in any sort of semblance that we, we would recognize. These are just protons and neutrons. So it's basically just a giant nucleus. And above that, we still have some iron, nickel, and nuclei hanging out um, that are still sort of cooling via neutrino emission. Uh, but because we've reached this point where we've reached uh, nuclear matter density, we have that strong repulsive part of the nuclear force. And that's what kicks in. So we initially have this infalling material. That very central core reaches nuclear matter density. And the strong nuclear force provides this sort of repulsive, uh, ener uh, repulsive pressure that will start driving a shockwave out through this iron, nickel material. Now what's going to happen, though, is that as the shockwave is, is traversing the iron, and nickel uh, outer layer here, uh, it's going to dissociate that iron and nickel into free protons and neutrons. So we're essentially losing energy along the way as this, this shock begins to propagate through this outer core uh, to the photodissociated iron and, nuclei, and uh, nickel. Um, so although we start out with a shock, this should be enough to create explosion, right? We just need that shock to traverse the star, and then we have our supernova and we're all done. Um, that shock actually loses all of its energy before it even reaches the edge of the iron nickel core. Um, so we're left with this sort of picture where we have this dense chunk of nuclear matter that's uh, cooling via neutrinos. It's slowly random walking their way out. We have a bunch of free protons and neutrons. And we have this stalled shock uh, within about 0.12 seconds since, since core collapse. This is all happening very quickly. Um, our shock has sort of stalled. Uh, and we, we then need to start reheating it in order to actually generate an explosion. And so this is the picture we're left with of the, about this mechanism of, yes? Can I ask a question? What's the process of actually stalling the shock before it's it's uh, taking iron and nickel nuclei and breaking them up into free protons and neutrons, which is 
taking away energy, yeah. Um, so this is the picture we're left with, right? our, our mechanism of core collapse supernova. And this is sort of the typical neutrino heated convection model. So you can get some more extreme supernova models that use jets and magnetic rotational stuff. But for our, our sort of generic run of the mill star, uh, we, we think that the neutrino uh, heated convection model is what's actually happening. And so we're left with this chunk of uh, dense nuclear matter in the core. So this is the, the giant atomic nucleus that's about 0.8 solar masses. Uh, we call that the proto-neutron star. So this is the chunk of matter that's going to cool and be left as a remnant neutron star. And above that, um, we have the neutrino sphere. So essentially, our neutrinos are trapped in this dense, uh, dense, dense material. And they random walk their way out until they reach the surface of last scattering, which we call the neutrino sphere. This is like a photosphere in any other star, but for neutrinos. Uh, and from there, the neutrinos can free stream outwards. Um, and so above, we have our shock installed above the, the proto-neutron star. But between that, we have a region of net cooling. And this is cooling via neutrinos. Again, neutrinos are our, our major process here. We don't really care about photons because those are trapped. So we have cooling via neutrinos. And then we have heating via neutrinos. And then we have convection and turbulence that's occurring between these two layers. Um, and the, this heating due to neutrinos, it's basically like boiling uh, a pot on the stove, where our neutrinos are heating this material. And it's starting to boil and bubble up. And that's what ends up reheating this shock and driving the explosion outward. But this is a very delicate process, uh, where about a 1 or 2% change in the, the neutrino physics and the neutrino emission from this proto-neutron star is enough to either cause the star to explode or to not explode. So it's a very fine process in terms of this neutrino physics. And the neutrino physics is very, very uncertain. I mean, neutrinos are kind of weird. It's dependent on a lot of uh, dense nuclear matter physics that we don't totally understand because we can't explore these phenomena in laboratories. Um, but as we currently understand it, uh, this is how we expect uh, core collapse supernova to explode. Um, and so we can do big simulations of the, these things. We take everything we know about hydrodynamics, general relativity, et cetera, and put it on a, a computer. And we can start running these, these simulations and simulating these events. So you can see this is a, a simulation done with the flash code, which is the code that I use. And you can see that the shock has begun to form, and it sort of stalls. But we get a lot of convection and turbulence that's being driven by that neutrino heating. Um, and it's going to just sort of slosh around for a while. The, the shock actually recedes a bit. Um, the distance scale down here is going to start changing in a minute as the shock takes off. But it sort of just stalls here for about a fraction of a second while it, that neutrino heating has to kick in um, in order to drive the explosion. Should take off any minute now. <laughs> yeah. Start watching the evil juice. <laughs> <laughs> So yeah, here we are about half a second after core collapse. And we can see that the shock's sort of starting to re-expand. Um, and the, the shock then takes off and propagates outwards. So it's sort of this delayed process where the core collapse uh, and the initial shock formation takes a fraction of a second. Uh, but then that shock just stalls and kind of sits there for a little while. And we have to reheat it with this neutrino heated convection. Um, and we're seeing this in our, in our models and very reliably among different models as well. Uh, yes? This was 2D project or 3D projected in a 2D. Yeah. So where's the asymmetry coming from? What's that? The asymmetry at yeah. that end there. Um, we can't fast forward, I think, through it. But uh, oh wait, here we go. At the, the very end. Yeah. Um, so you just end up with sort of slight perturbations in the convection and the convective flows early on that like grow into bigger instabilities and causes asymmetries. Yeah. Uh, so what will we actually detect? I mean, obviously, we're all used to the supernova light curves and, and what those look like. Um, but in terms of the neutrinos and gravitational waves, um, what will we detect from a, a core collapse supernova? Um, so starting with the neutrinos, uh, there are three different uh, neutrino flavors. We have our electron neutrinos, the, the mu and tau neutrino fl flavors as well. Uh, and in supernovae, I'm going to think about just this blue line is our electron neutrinos. The orange line is the electron antineutrinos. And then I'm going to roll all those other neutrino flavors together into what I'm going to call a new X, because they all kind of behave the same. So we just roll those together. Um, so the neutrino emission, this is luminosity versus time post bounce, so the time of that, that initial core collapse. Um, and for all of these three different, um, different fl neutrino flavors and anti-neutrino flavors. So we get this initial burst in just the electron neutrinos. And then we call this the neutronization burst. Um, so this comes from the fact that as the shock is initially plowing through this dense material, um, it's suddenly lowering the density. There were all those neutrinos that were created from the inverse beta decay processes or from the beta decay processes that are trapped. And as the shock propagates outwards, it lowers the density just enough to, to release all of these electron neutrinos. So we see an initial burst in the electron neutrino flavor that we don't get in the other, other th flavors. So is just a few, less than thousands of bursts per second. What was that? So the velocity, the, the oh, 
This is in beta. So this is in uh, 10 to the 51 ergs per second. Okay. Yes, good catch. I'm sorry. <laughs> A very low luminosity supernova. <laughs> no, I should have gotten that. Yeah, that should be 10 to the 51 ergs per second. Okay. <laughs> um, and then eventually we can see where the, the explosion sets in, in that um, as the uh, shock is stalled, we have matter accreting onto our neutron star. And that's sort of feeding the, this protein neutron star to create more neutrinos. Uh, but as the explosion takes off, we get less accretion onto our protein neutron star, so we get less neutrinos. And you can see that sort of drop off in the, the neutrino luminosities in this simulation. Um, and then we're left with just, just this cooling tail. So that protein neutron star is just going to leave, be left there to cool and turn into a, a cold remnant neutron star. Um, so these neutrino luminosities will continue for tens, hundreds of seconds um, before they become undetectable. Um, and these are things that we can detect on Earth. Um, so supernova 1987A is famously sort of our first multi-messenger detection. Everyone likes to say LIGO and GW170817 was, but 87A was the first multi-messenger detected. Um, and so this is energy in MeV versus time in seconds. Uh, predominantly in the Kamio Kande detector, but also in IMB, they saw a few neutrinos. Uh, so they found about 30 MeV neutrinos over about 10 seconds, which is exactly what we expect from supernova models. So this really validated this uh, neutrino-driven convection model uh, in the 80s. Um, and we can now do a lot better with more advanced detectors. So we now have many, many, many detectors. So we'll, what we call the SNOOS network. This is the supernova early warning system. And it's a collaboration of different detectors uh, that if they're all triggered on a supernova event, we'll put out an alert to the community, uh, provide pointing inf information and uh, other follow-up information. Um, you can get an alert yourself if you want to sign up and, and get to know when Betelgeuse goes off in the next 100,000 years. Um, you can sign up for that alert yourself. Um, but the interesting thing about neutrinos is, like I said, there are those three different flavors, the electron neutrinos, the muon neutrinos, and the tau neutrinos, and also the anti-neutrino flavors. So each of these detectors is sensitive to different neutrino flavors. Um, and so we really need this combination of different neutrinos or different neutrino detector facilities in order to piece together the whole supernova picture because we need all of the neutrino flavor information. Um, so this is an example of something that of a supernova detected in Super Kamio Kande at 10 kiloparsecs. Um, this is events per energy bin versus energy in MeV through the different channels uh, in super K. Uh, so the dominant channel at super K is this inverse beta decay channel. So this is going to tell us about electron antineutrino flavors um, coming from core collapse supernovae. And you can see that for an event at 10 kiloparsecs, we'll get thousands of events um, summed over different energies uh, in a super K-like detector. Um, but we'll get, uh, with other facilities, we'll get other flavor information as well. So we get both energy dependent information, we get time information, we get flavor information from neutrinos. So for gravitational waves, um, gravitational waves from core collapse supernovae are kind of a mess. Uh, so LIGO, when it's looking for binary merger events, it can use this nice templated search. You all will remember these, these strain plots for the, the binary mergers have that nice sort of oscillatory thing that we can make templates for and match in the detectors, and it's all great. Um, but core collapse supernovae, this is just four different progenitors for a couple of different rotation rates. And someone can tell me how to make a template out of that. Um, and the, the big problem is the convection, right? So we have this early bounce signal, but as soon as convection turns in, that's a very stochastic process, and it's very random. Um, so you just can't template it in the same way that we do for binary merger events. Um, so this has been a big problem for LIGO. Right now, in order to detect a supernovae, they're just hoping it's energetic enough to sort of throw off their uh, random event detector. Um, and that's the best we can hope for. Can I ask a quick question? So I'm not, yeah. I don't Strain. How does the magnitude of that compare to um, binary black hole mergers? I actually have no idea. It's worth magnitude less. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. So the energy uh, and gravitational waves emitted in uh, one of these things is uh, well, realistically going to be less than 10 to the minus 10 solar masses. Um, whereas, say, in GW 1509 14, um, Solar masses um, of gravitational, uh, well, of energy and gravitational waves was emitted. So, yeah, they're, they're not as strong, um, but still very interesting. <laughs> yeah, which also means they have to be a lot closer for us to see them, right? Yeah. Um, so, the easier way to think about uh, Core collapse, gravitational waves from core collapse supernovae, at least in my opinion, is in the, the spectrogram space. So we have the gravitational wave frequency versus time post bounce. Uh, and the color is just telling us about the energy in that, that frequency. Um, so core collapse supernovae has this, have this very distinct sort of turnover 
in this, this peak dominant gravitational wave frequency um, that's sort of universal among different progenitors and things. So this is the, the easier way to start thinking about core collapse supernova gravitational wave signals um, is trying to think about how to, to pin down this signal here. Um, and this should look somewhat familiar to uh, sort of binary uh, merger events. So these have this sort of distinct upturn of that chirp that we get from binary mergers. Um, but instead, we're sort of turning over and flattening out instead. Uh, the other thing to notice is that we're in the, the range of about 500 to 1,000 hertz here, um, which is a much, much higher frequency than binary merger events. Um, so we're sort of outside of LIGO sensitivity. They are detectable for sort of galactic events, but we're not really in the, the prime space of what LIGO is built for uh, with these frequencies. Um, so the, the cute thing about these, this turnover here in this peak gravitational wave frequency is it's coming from the proto-neutron star. So the gravitational waves from a core collapse supernovae event are basically just normal modes of the proto-neutron star as they're emitted by gravitational waves. So we can do sort of a typical astroseismology analysis of the proto-neutron star and start picking out uh, these different bands of gravitational wave emission. Um, so this is a really think, simple way to think about where these gravitational waves are coming from. We have this proto-neutron star and it's got certain eigenmodes and eigenfrequencies, and the convection and things happening above it are coming down and ringing it like a bell, and that's emitting these gravitational waves. Um, so for the rest of this talk, I'm going to talk about this normal mode, this uh, sort of main turnover mode, but we can also do analysis with other modes as well. Um, but for the remainder of the talk, I'll just talk about this, this sort of dominant turnover mode. Can I ask my question before you start this slide? Yeah. Here? So what you're saying is that the gravitational waves are being produced by the primary particle of the primary neutron, the neutron star, and not <laughs> all this mass that's actually not directly all this mass that's sort of swirling around outside of it in the stellar envelope. The mass will also contribute a little bit. Okay. Um, so that's where you get like weird noise stuff coming in. This does a lot of simulations show uh, frequencies down here as well. Um, but sort of these these really strong bands you see are coming from the proton neutron star. Okay. Yeah. Um, so what can we possibly learn from these multi-messenger detections? We have sort of walked through the, sort of the generic picture of what this emission will look like, but how well can we tell about different progenitors and different explosion mechanisms and, and other physics from these detections of neutrinos and gravitational waves? Uh, so to start out with, um, I used several hundred core collapse supernova simulations. Um, these are 1D simulations run with a flash code. Uh, the benefit of 1D simulations is I can run it in a couple of hours versus 3D simulations take months and months of supercomputer time. So that lets me use hundreds of simulations rather than one or two. And this lets us uh, sort of span the progenitor range of possible, possible progenitor stars. Uh, so the simula simulations we've run have been from 9 to 120 solar masses, um, all first assuming single stars with no rotation. So we had some assumptions here. Um, but we've done these uh, self-consistent exploding models of, of core collapse supernovae um, and sort of looked at what the multi-messenger signals are and how they're correlated with progenitor and explosion properties. Uh, so this figure on the right shows you that's essentially just a correlation matrix. Um, so things that are in red or have numbers close to one are going to be a very strong positive correlation. And things that are very blue or, or have a number close to negative one are going to be a strong negative correlation. Um, and then things that are sort of gray show you no correlation at all. Um, as you can see here, we have a lot of really, really strong correlations. Um, and that's because I've sort of picked out the quantities that I've plotted here. There are a lot of things that are not correlated at all. So things like the zero age mean sequence mass ends up as totally uncorrelated with neutrino and gravitational wave signals. Um, and so I've left that off up here because it's uninteresting. Um, but there are a lot of progenitor properties that are just not going to be uh, detectable using these signals. Um, so the, the things that I have on this matrix here, uh, we have the core compact, what we call the core compactness. Um, so this is basically the mass of that uh, iron core over its radius at the time of core collapse. So it's telling us how compact that iron core is uh, at the time of core collapse. And this is something that's very, very non-monotonic with zero main sequence mass. So this is zero main se sequence mass on the x-axis here, and this core compactness parameter on the y-axis. And as you can see, it's very non-monotonic with uh, zero main sequence mass. But because the core collapse mechanism is really sensitive to the core physics, it is the core collapse after all, um, it ends up that this core uh, compactness parameter is much more tightly correlated with the explosion properties and with the explosion mechanism than the overall zero mean sequence mass, for example. Um, now, the reason why it's highly non-monotonic uh, goes back to some very weird physics that happens with our stellar evolution models up to the time of core collapse. So how, uh, for example, uh, shell carbon burning is happening before core collapse, um, and whether or not that's convective. Um, and so that's where you get this non-monotonicity coming from um, in these, these models here. 
Uh, the other parameter I have on here is the protein neutron star mass, so that chunk of, of nuclear matter that's left in the core that's going to be a protein neutron star. Um, this isn't going to be necessarily the final neutron star mass because this is before any fallback accretion has happened. So we sort of expect that maybe this explosion occurs and then some material accretes back down onto the neutron star. So this is sort of a starting point for our neutron star mass. It may get heavier later on. Uh, we also have the explosion energy, sort of self-explanatory there. Uh, and then I have two uh, observable quantities here for neutrinos. Uh, so I have the total number of neutrinos that we would detect in super Kamiokande at 10 kiloparsecs. So just summing up every neutrino we saw, which is going to be pre predominantly electron antineutrinos, uh, and also looking at what their average energy is. So this is just looking at one detector. We're going to sum up all of the neutrinos that we see and also look at their average energy. So just sort of simplifying this spectrum and not worrying about energy dependence or time dependence, uh, and just think about what the total neutrino emission is in predominantly electron antineutrinos. Um, and as you can see, these things are all tightly correlated. Um, so if we look at this little sub box here, we have here on the, the y-axis are sort of our observable neutrino quantities. And the x-axis are the things we want to learn, learn about, the structure of the core at the time of collapse, the protein neutron star mass, the explosion energy. Uh, and these quantities are, are strongly correlated. So anything above about 0.6 is a very strong correlation. Some of these are up to about 0.95. So these are things that if we get a detection of the total number of neutrinos, I can tell you what the protein neutron star mass is. Uh, so to break that out a little bit, this is the average energy of those ne detected neutrinos versus the total number of neutrinos. Uh, and the color tells you about the protein neutron star mass. So you can see how this scales nicely with both average energy and, and uh, number of neutrino counts um, for our simulations uh, with the protein neutron star mass. And this little blue band here sh shows you the, sort of the expected errors we expect to see in super K for an observation at 10 kiloparsecs. So these are a realistic uh, sort of sample of what our error bars would be for a detection. Um, so with error bars that small, we can easily pick out on this plot what a possible protein neutron star mass would be. And we can also do this with gravitational waves. Um, so as I said before, the sort of main mode of the, the gravitational waves is coming from the protein neutron star. So we can, even with 1D models, we can model the gravitational wave emission a little bit. So I can't get the full spectrogram from 1D because gravitational waves are inherently a multi-D thing. Um, but I can do this eigenfrequency analysis of the protein neutron star and figure out what this main mode is going to be. And so that that's what we've done for these hundreds of, of uh, 1D su supernova models, is determine the evolution of this um, sort of main dominant gravitational wave frequency. So this background spectrogram is from a 3D simulation. Uh, and this blue and red bands are, are 1D models have overlaid on it. So you can see we can pick out what that, that dominant mode is. Yeah. Yeah, just picking out the F mode. <laughs> it's that easy. <laughs> yeah. um, and so again, we've sort of considered a billion different quantities when thinking about the evolution of this gravitational wave frequency and looking for correlations. Um, there's so many different ways to parameterize this. And what we ended up finding out was really important is the slope of the gravitational wave frequency very early on, so just after core collapse, and the slope of the gravitational wave frequency later on. And we've tried all sorts of weird functional fits to this and doing different parameterizations, but it ends up just the very bare, simplest thing we could do of just looking at the, time, uh, the slope and the time evolution of this at different times is what ends up telling us the most about the progenitor star and explosion. Uh, skipped ahead. Okay, so we can do the same sort of correlation analysis with the, the gravitational wave uh, emission and these, these different quantities we want to know about. So we have here again our core compactness parameter, our proton neutron star mass, the explosion energy, and we're correlating that with the, the slope of the gravitational wave frequency at early times, so just after core collapse. Um, and again, we're getting correlations of around 0.9, which is a very, very strong correlation. Uh, so I've plotted here. Yes? So, yeah. um, what, uh, what sort of distance? Um, is the supernova um, for, for these results because you won't see um, a, a um, well, like kind of one of these like regular number of fainting supernovae at 10 kiloparsecs, mm -hmm. um, precisely because the templates and searches um, mm -hmm. can't, be, can't be used, and so it's um, just it, you lose so much of the incident SNR from the from the excess power searches mm -hmm. um, that. Um, well, uh, you're penalized twice, like once for the fact that you don't, uh, the gravitational waves aren't strong, and then second, because the search method is um, non-optimal. Non mm -hmm. um, so I guess, uh, yeah, sorry, what, uh, what distance um, so is that for? Yeah, so I haven't assumed a distance here. Um, but we're hopeful that we might be able to do 10 kiloparsecs because it ends up, we've been working with LIGO on how well they can reconstruct these things. And it looks like to get this really loud mode, you, you might be able to get out to 10 kiloparsecs. Right, and you don't um, have to find it in a yeah. search, right? You can be 
be triggered by someone else, and then if you know it's there, so that yeah. you don't have this issue of, of where you lose SNR, which is for some blind search, because if you yeah. have the time of the signal from the neutrinos, then you can go in and recover all of your problems. Sure, sure. sure. Yeah. I, I guess, uh, well, a lot of the kind of the recent work on the, um, oh, it's like kind of like a um, Lego, um, like kind of doing uh, things like this, um, have all been looking at false alarm, uh, false alarm uh, probabilities um, of like ten uh, percent, which of course uh, you know it's it's not even anywhere near three sigma, um, and so I don't know. Um, I guess uh, uh, what sort of, um, of uh, false alarm probabilities um, like kind of uh, are you able to be able to achieve with uh, uh, with the yeah. um, like kind of analyses that you've been doing? Yeah, so we're assuming that we know the event is happening because of the neutrinos. Okay. Um, and just using that and going from there. Um, so that's, there's a still a lot of, that's very preliminary work right now, so I don't want to talk about it too much. Sure. Um, but we're still sort of digging into this. But I'm hopeful we can get it to, out to a further distance than like an actual LIGO detection because we have that neutrino trigger to fall back on. Mm -hmm. um, to be announced. <laughs> um, See, so yeah, I have a plot here of the, the slope of that early gravitational wave frequency uh, versus the proto neutron star mass here on the, the y axis and that core compactness parameter uh, in the color bar. And again, we get this nice relationship between these quantities um, where we, if we know the, the slope of this uh, gravitational wave frequency, we can maybe learn things about the proto neutron star mass and the, the core compactness parameter. Now, I don't have error bars on here for exact, exactly this problem about event reconstruction is much more unknown for LIGO and, and supernovae uh, than it is for uh, super Kamiokande and, and reconstructing the neutrino signal. Um, so this is a much bigger uncertainties built into it than that neutrino signal um, because we still don't have those algorithms uh, worked out in order to, uh, to reconstruct these events really faithfully. Can I ask yeah. a question just so I can understand intuitively this is going on here? So the time between the transition and the early time slope in your spectrogram the late time slope, mm -hmm. is, that on the is that strongly dependent on the radius of your progenitor star? Because of oh, this thing? there's some fallback time of the material that then rings up. So I'm trying to understand yeah. essentially why the shape looks like this and how to understand that. Yeah, so essentially we have initially the, this at this point, uh, yeah, we're still sort of adding matter to the core. And then it's so that the accretion sort of slows down a bit. So it sort of like settles down in a way. Yeah. Does that make sense? But yeah, but yeah. That time, the time yeah. between when that happens, so I guess the duration. Yeah, so every super or every core collapse event is going to have like different slopes here. Okay. Um, so I probably should have plotted a lot of them because that's very informative. But yeah, the, the way that the time evolution works is is very different for all of them. Yeah. Um, so yeah, how well can we actually do with this? If we get a supernova that goes off tomorrow, Betelgeuse is doing weird stuff. Who really knows? Um, can we actually use this information to sort of reconstruct information about the core collapse event? Um, so what I've done is I've taken sort of mock data, so like a, know what we know about uh, possible neutrino detections from our supernova simulations, and how well can I then reconstruct things like the, the protein transfer mass from that data? Uh, so this is using the number of neutrino counts and the average energy of the neutrinos to reconstruct the protein transfer mass uh, for various simulations. And you can see here that using the number of neutrino counts, we can very faithfully reconstruct uh, the protein transfer mass within some error. Um, for, the, for this whole range of possible core collapse supernova events. Um, now, the errors are a little bit bigger using the, the average energies, uh, but again, this is for a distance of 10 kiloparsecs. So if we go out to a further distance, our number of counts will go down and the errors will get bigger over here. So just keep that in mind that the relative error here is really dependent on, on the distance that we're assuming here. So this is for 10 kiloparsecs. Um, but this will give us a fairly reliable handle on the protein transfer mass prior to fallback accretion for this sort of event. Uh, and I showed here just... Uh, um, the plots for just using the number of counts or just using the average energy, we com can combine this information, right? We can combine it also with the gravitational wave information, which will reduce these error bars even more. Um, so if we combine these measurements, uh, we can get an even improved fit upon this. Um, and we've also used one neutrino flavor in this. So this is, again, using super Kamiokande, which is predominantly electron antineutrinos. And we're going to have however many tens of, of neutrino detectors online. Uh, which are detecting different neutrino flavors, which are also sensitive to this proton neutron star mass. Um, and combining that information in here as well is, again, going to help uh, re reduce the errors on our fits and, and provide us with more information about the proton neutron star evolution. Um, and this is, again, just for the proton neutron star mass, but we can do the same thing for the, that, that core compactness parameter. So providing constraints on the, the structure of the stellar core at the time of collapse, the explosion energy, and all of this independent with, of electromagnetic observations. This is just using neutrino and gravitational wave information. 
Um, and the beautiful thing here is if we go to pre-explosion imaging, for example, to constrain stellar evolution, we see the supernova go off, we go into archival images, and we see what our, our pre-supernova was, our, our progenitor star was. And that gives us constraints on the size and the surface of the star before, at the time of core collapse, but it tells us nothing about the core. Um, so it gives us sort of one way to constrain stellar evolution models from the surface. Using this, we can do both. We can constrain the core of the car, star and also the surface at the same time. Um, and this can provide much, much more stringent constraints for our stellar evolution models up to the time of core collapse for uh, massive stars. Uh, and again, sort of getting at the explosion energy, this is something that falls out of uh, light curves very easily, uh, but it'll provide an interesting point of comparison. Just hopefully those things match up, right? Because <laughs> then we, we maybe don't understand things if they don't. Uh, so this has all been for successful events. So we see our stars explode and, and we assume that they all uh, explode successfully. Um, but we have this other sort of dark half of the core collapse super, supernova world where sometimes we have these stars that maybe don't explode successfully. So they undergo core collapse, but that shock revival isn't energetic enough to drive a full explosion and the whole thing collapses to a black hole. And we call these failed supernovae. So these are massive stars that undergo core collapse but don't result in a full supernova explosion. Now these things won't release sort of a beautiful light curve and electromagnetic emissions, so we don't observe them very often, but they will still uh, emit neutrinos on gravitational waves. So we can still detect these for nearby events. Um, they'll just look maybe a little bit different. They can still provide us a lot of the same information though. Um, so starting with this question of which stars explode, so some of our supernova models explode, some of them don't, uh, which stars do we expect to explode? Uh, this is probably what you all saw in your sort of Astro 101 course where we have everything less than 40 solar masses explodes, everything heavier doesn't, and we get a direct black hole collapse. Um, and ends up this is wildly wrong. Um, so unlearn this, please. <laughs> Uh, the picture is much, much more complex. Um, so these are the results from three different supernova groups. Uh, the x-axis in all these is zero-age main sequence mass, running from usually about 9 or 10 solar masses up to 120 solar masses. Uh, and the y-axis on all of these shows just different sort of explosion parameterizations and models. Uh, and you can see that all of these independent supernova groups and super, supernova codes are seeing the same effect, where you see this non-monotonicity with um, zero-age main sequence mass in explodability. So the, the colored uh, sort of bands here are stars that explode, and the black ones are the ones that collapse a black hole. Uh, and so for all of these groups, we're seeing this non-monotonic behavior in explodability and zero-edge mean sequence mass. And this comes back to the core compactness. So the, the, core compact, the core collapse part of the core collapse supernovae is dependent more on the structure of the core than it is on the zero-edge mean sequence mass. And so if the structure of the core is non-monotonic with zero-edge mean sequence mass, then the behavior of our supernova will be as well. Um, so the, the result is starting to fall out, and this is, is really theoretically uh, pretty robust at this point, is that um, this non-monotonic behavior is maybe a real thing. Now this is really dependent on our progenitor models for these simulations. Our initial conditions come out of 1D super, uh, stellar evolution models. Um, so there's some questions about uncertainties there, uh, but given what we know so far, um, this has been fairly well robustly modeled, and it's also starting to be seen in the 2D and 3D simulations as well. So if you take the 2D and 3D simulations and plot them along the same sort of thing, we have much fewer models, so it's a, a much less fine grid, uh, but they're starting to show the same sort of non-monotonic behavior uh, with zero mean sequence mass. So, yeah, so yeah. What's the maximum mass of a progenitor for which you still get a neutron star? There's no absolute mass. So this is, the green ones will give you a neutron star and the black ones will give you a black hole. Yeah, okay. So, no, I'm just trying to say, so if you can have a progenitor that's sun, you can solar mass and you can still give you a neutron star. Yeah, so essentially that, that star has lost so much mass along its lifetime that it behaves more like a nine solar mass star than a, but yeah. But why are there these narrow bands between the 60 solar mass progenitor? On the lower right hand side. Lower right hand side. Lower right hand side. Down here? What? Yeah, they might become very sparse when you go to the right. Oh, this is just a sampling thing. So they, they, they only have progenitor models for like 40, 60, 80. Um, so it's very finely sampled. It's basically sampled with the IMF. Um, so we get very fine sampling down at about 10 solar masses in progenitor mass, uh, and then it's less finely sampled further out. Yeah. Black is neutron star, green is black hole. No, green is black hole, black is neutron star. Gray is we just didn't have a model there. Wait a minute, say that so the, the green is a neutron star, the black is a black hole, and the, these gray bands are, do, we don't have a model there. We didn't model that mass. And so you're getting yeah. a lot of mass loss, you're saying, 30 to 40 solar mass range, which is, um, which is keeping the uh, core mass down. Yeah. Is this for solar metallics? Yes. Non-rotating single stars. Yeah. <laughs> what was that? Are you thinking someone's general models 
Yeah, so these are from the Suckbold 2016 okay, progenitor set. So it's a Kepler. Yeah. Yeah. There are some that are basic. Yeah, so these, I think all three of these use the Suckbold. I was trying to compare between progenitor. Yeah. <laughs> are you finding any agreement between the three codes beyond just like that it is non monotonic? More than one Yeah, like is there yeah. is there like agreement between like core compactness gives you like this thing versus that? No, we were hoped. Um, but also these three groups are, are blowing up the stars in wildly different ways. Yeah. Um, so these two groups basically turn up the neutrino heating, sort of just like arbitrarily turn it up. Uh, this sim these simulations were done, this was work that I did, um, where we sort of modeled the effects of convection and turbulence. Um, and so depending on how you blow up your star, things are going to behave a little differently. It seems like there's some yeah. agreement between 20 and 30 solar masses at least in terms of the, what the power limit looks like, right? No. So 20, and for these two, yeah, but up here we see that they explode and they don't down here. And yeah. <laughs> I don't know, this statement of whether explosion or non-explosion happens can get a little bit ambiguous depending on like kind of the extra factors that are put in. Yeah. So I guess for all of these, um, I wouldn't believe absolutely that a certain star explodes or does not explode based on these 1D models. But it tells us that the core compactness is more important than the zero instrument sequence mass. I think that's the takeaway message here. Um, because again, these are 1D parameterized models. There are free parameters in all of them. Um, none of them have predictive power. So don't <laughs> um, but yeah, the lesson here is just that it's non-monotonic with zero instrument sequence mass. Yeah. Sounds a little bad with the, with the suburb of, of with, with, with a few cases where we have the progenitor school, a bit of a progenitor school for supernovae? Yeah, that's actually my next slide. Thank you for that. <laughs> 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 um, so, yeah, getting at this red supergiant problem, um, where if we have this sort of simple model where we expect everything less than 40 solar masses to uh, explode, we expect to be able to go to pre explosion imaging with the supernova that we observe uh, and find 40 solar mass red supergiants that were there before this explosion occurred. Um, but the, more massive, the most massive red supergiant that we have pre explosion imaging for for a supernova is about 20 ish solar masses, 18, somewhere in there. So, this is yeah. supernova with a known uh, remnant black hole? Or a black hole? Maybe. Well, this is a direct. Right, BH1 is a direct collapse, but all I see yeah. so are all these neutral stars? Yeah, so these are all supernovae that we, s we saw go off, um, and then we went back to, pr to archival imaging right. and found the, the red supergiant. No, but I'm talking yeah. about the relic. About the, the relic. Do I, don't know, I don't think we have neutron stars, uh, like actual observ observations of the neutron star for all of these. We just have the, the supernova, and what then we have archival also, imaging. Yeah, it's yes. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, yes. There's also 79C with an identified yeah. uh, relic. It has a, uh, from the actual, they know that, that it has a black hole as a relic. Yeah, but do we know what the progenitor mass was? Yeah. Okay. Um, you can look yeah. about it later, but okay. I'm just wondering if it was okay. So yeah, there's this sort of what, what we call the red supergiant problem of if we believe our sort of 40 solar masses and less uh, explodes and everything else doesn't, um, we should see 40 solar mass uh, red supergiants exploding, and we don't. We see this cutoff at sort of 20-ish solar masses. Um, and we also have this weird case of the, the direct collapse. Um, so this event was um, the survey being done out of the Ohio State University led by uh, Adams et al., uh, where they've done this survey where they're just looking at massive stars, and they go back and look at them periodically. And if that star disappears, they assume it's a direct collapse. Um, and so far, they have one event, whether you believe it or not. Um, so they initially had this uh, massive star that they saw with HST in 2007. Then 2015, they go back and look, and it's gone. Um, and there was no sort of uh, electromagnetic transient associated with this at all. Well, they, they do not right? get like, twice as bright, but not supernova bright before it, uh, before it disappeared. Yeah, yeah. So no like supernova level of, of, uh, of transient. Um, and so they believe that this may be this sort of direct collapse uh, event, whereas it's this failed supernova event. So we have this may be one possible um, data point here at about 25 solar masses. 
Um, now, how do the, the neutrino and gravitational wave emission differ a little bit? So like I said before, we're not going to get electromagnetic transient, but we'll still get neutrino and gravitational wave emission. Um, so I have a bunch of different plots here for various different progenitor masses. Uh, and about half of these simulations explode and half of them don't. So this is shock radius uh, versus time post bounce. And you can see about half of them sort of take off and the other half just peter out and eventually collapse to a black hole. Uh, so this is the electron neutrino luminosity, again, versus time post bounce. Uh, and you can see our simulations that explode. When the explosion sets in, we get this down drop in the, the electron neutrino luminosity because we cut off the accretion to the proton neutron star. Um, whereas if we have a failed event, the neutrino luminosity remains high and even maybe grows a little bit because we have high accretion onto the proton neutron star until late times. Yes? Can you remind me of your um, alpha parameter? That's not like what yeah. it's representing. I'm sure you mentioned it. <laughs> Yeah, no, that's a good question. Um, I sort of brushed over that. Okay. Uh, so these simulations, um, we parameterized the effects of turbulence and convection in our 1D model. And we have this free parameter alpha. And we fit that to 3D simulations. And the best fit was 1.25. But if included 1.23 and 1.27, because there's error on that stuff. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Is it just the mixing length parameter? Or is it something? It's related to the mixing length parameter. Um, yeah. But same idea. Okay. So think about it that way. Yeah. Um, so yeah, the, elect the electron neutrino luminosities will remain high for failed events. Uh, if we look at the average energies of the neutrinos, they also remain high. So for successful explosions, they sort of drop off um, as the explosion sets in, and they sort of remain higher uh, for failed supernova events. And if we look at the gravitational wave frequency, it's a more subtle difference. Uh, but if we think about the turnover time of, of when this gravitational wave frequency sort of levels off, it doesn't level off in the same way as it does for successful events. Um, and so we see these slight subtle, subtle differences between failed and successful core collapse supernova events just from the neutrino uh, and gravitational wave emission. What's this little pink sign here in the, in the periodogram, in the spectrogram, for the gravitational wave frequency over time? Where? That, little, that right there, that, that, that guy. It goes like yeah. Um, what is that? We can come back to it later. Yeah. The okay, no, so what this is, is we're basically doing this eigenmode analysis. Um, and so we get sort of discrete eigenmodes. So we have initial mode that kicks on, and then this one's actually like levels off and it gets picked up by a different mode. And so you're seeing just sort of the fact that this is discrete in the way that we're doing it. In the real spectrogram, it's a little bit more continuous and beautiful. So, so you don't think that's a real thing that Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, Does the black hole form? So for this one, the 28 solar mass uh, is about two seconds. Uh, 13 and 100, it's three or four seconds. Yeah. Oh, is this where the lines uh, cut off? Yeah, so oh, I think okay. I haven't plugged this out far enough to see all of them. But the, you can see the 28 sort of falls off at two seconds. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so we can play the same game as we did with the successful explosions about how these quantities are correlated uh, with things we want to know about the progenitor star and, uh, and remnant. Uh, object. So we have here for the neutrinos, again, our sort of correlation matrix. Here we have some negatively correlated things. Uh, but what we have is the core co compactness parameter, that same thing about the stellar core at the time of collapse. Uh, the mass of the black hole. Um, so this is sort of what we predict the, the black hole remnant mass to be. Um, the time to black hole collapse. So from the time of core collapse to how long that core collapse, uh, the black hole formation actually happens. And again, correlating with the number of, of neutrinos that we detect and the average energy of the neutrinos. And again, all of these quantities are very strongly correlated. So if you tell me the number of neutrinos from a, a failed supernova event, I can tell you about the, the remnant compact object mass, how long that, that uh, pretty neutron star survived before it collapsed to a black hole, um, and things about the stellar structure as well. Uh, and we can learn things from the gravitational waves as well, where again we look at, this time we're going to think about that end frequency, so the, the slope of the gravitational wave frequency just before core collapse. Uh, and how that correlates with black hole mass and core compactness. And again, we get very, very strong correlations. Um, so for both failed and successful events, we can play the same game of learning things from the neutrinos and gravitational waves and pinpointing things about compact object masses and stellar core structure um, independent of electromagnetic uh, emission, um, which is very unique. Um, yes, so again, just uh, unlike electromagnetic emission, um, the gravitational wave and neutrino information is just as informative for failed events. Yeah. Do the other studies do these types of correlation matrices? And if so, do you see similar correlations and anti-correlations between the codes? No. So as far as I know, no one else has done this sort of thing. So hopefully yeah. they will. I mean, hopefully they will. But also, I don't think they will. Um, because <laughs> uh, the reason why is because these other groups are changing their neutrinos physics in order to get the explosion. Um, and so you just don't want to believe the neutrino emission 
from something where you're altering the neutrino emission, right? right? Like um, that's a lever arm, so you yeah, um, and they also tend to cut out the protein neutron star. So they basically like cut out the inner compact object and uh, make assumptions about what the neutrino luminosity is um, in order to get an explosion. So you can't tell anything about the protein neutron star mass from that either. Yeah. Um, so this information we uniquely can get at. <laughs> Um, all right, how long do I have? I, I have five minutes. All right, five minutes to talk about neutrino oscillations. Um, so I've talked a lot about neutrinos, and I've said absolutely nothing about neutrino oscillations. So we know that these oscillations occur from things like uh, solar observations, uh, reactor neutrino experiments, et cetera. And it ends up that they're very, very complicated in core-collapse supernovae as well. So again, we have our three flavor states, electron, muon, and tau neutrino flavors. And these can all sort of swap between each other um, as, they, as they will in some ways, because quantum mechanics is weird. Um, and it ends up that can really mess with our observed neutrino spectrum. So from core collapse supernovae, we expect the neutrino spectrum for all flavors to look something like a sort of Fermi-Dirac uh, spectrum. Um, but this can be shifted around due to different, different physics. So if we have things like the average energy and the, the total number of counts, and also so the, how pinched this spectrum is, depends a lot on the progenitor star, the equation of state, and various neutrino physics. Um, but if we add in additional physics about neutrino flavor mixing, that can do weird things where it causes big splits and, and swaps in the spectra. Um, so it no longer looks like a clean Fermi Dirac because we have different flavor mix flavors mixing to each other. You can also do this with weird dark matter phenomena as well. Um, so we have some really unique physics that we can learn uh, from observations of, of the, the spectrum of a core collapse supernovae, but we really need to be able to disentangle what is a progenitor effect, what is an equation of state effect from things like neutrino oscillations and dark matter phenomena. Um, and there are a lot of different flavor mixing of phenomena that can occur so on very different scales within the core collapse supernovae. So if we look at, at about 10 kilometers, we get what we call fast flavor conversions. Um, further out, uh, we get collective oscillation regime. And this is essentially the neutrino field itself is so dense that the neutrinos are interacting with each other. And that changes how the neutrino flavors interact. So this is highly nonlinear. And because of this nonlinearity, it is impossible to sort of model this in current core collapse supernova simulations. These 3D simulations are already the cutting edge of what we can do computationally. Um, we have, for example, 3D simulations that are taking 50 million core hours at, at top supercomputing facilities like Mira. Uh, and if you add uh, so a little bit, just the most basic flavor mixing physics, you get double the, the computing time that that takes. And that's not doing things like this neutrino self interactions, which become highly nonlinear. Um, so we just don't have the computing time to do this. And so we don't understand what this phenomenon are going to look like. And we cannot make predictions about the neutrino spectra will look like. Um, so if we get a nearby supernova, we currently don't have predictions about what that spectrum will look like because of, of neutrino oscillations. Um, but if we can back out some of the physics uh, using other observations, we can maybe help disentangle equation of state effects, for example, from oscillation effects. Uh, and we have this other window in gravitational waves. Um, so again, we can sort of model this uh, peak gravitational wave frequency that probes the same physics in the same region of the star as the neutrinos. The neutrinos are emitted from the protein neutron star, and the gravitational waves are due to the protein neutron star eigenfrequencies. Um, so if we look at how these things are correlated, we have a Fermi Dirac spectrum, which can be reasonably reconstructed using an average energy and an RMS energy for the neutrinos. Um, so if we look at the slope of the gravitational wave frequency and how that's related to the um, average energy of the neutrinos and the RMS energy for the neutrinos for both failed explosions and, and uh, successful explosions, we see that these things are related. So if we detect the gravitational waves, we can also learn about what the average energy and the RMS energies for these neutrinos and reconstruct a spectrum. Um, and so this is a plot here that shows uh, the, the black line is for just sort of our run-of-the-mill supernova simulation. Um, the blue line shows if we s assume a normal mass hierarchy for very simple flavor mixing, and the green is for an inverted mass hierarchy. And the red line here, uh, there is a color band on that as well, is our fit. So using the gravitational wave emission to reconstruct the neutrino spectrum, um, we can then get this fit here, uh, which you can see the error bands are very, very slow, very, very low. Um, and so what this fit tells us is that fit encompasses all of the progenitor and equation of state effects. Um, so all of that physics is already encompassed in the gravitational wave physics. And we can use that to reconstruct sort of a basic neutrino spectrum, which by comparison, we can then parse out what is uh, a, a flavor oscillation effect versus what is an equation of state effect. Because all of the equation of state physics is, is already in this, this fit spectrum here. Um, so again, by obser observe comparison with observed signals, we can then distinguish flavor mixing effects and dark matter effects from sort of more basic progenitor and equation of state physics. Um, and this is still very preliminary and uh, sort of working with LIGO and SNOOS to sort of understand the uncertainties and observations, how well we can reconstruct these gravitational wave signals uh, and how well we can do this, this fitting again in later times. Uh, so to wrap things up, um, what will we possibly learn from the next nearby core collapse supernovae? Uh, uh, and a lot. Um, and I don't think we even know how much at this point. Um, so 
we'll learn about the progenitor structure and stellar evolution prior to core collapse. So again, providing constraints that are independent of pre-explosion uh, imaging and independent of electromagnetic emission, um, we constrain the stellar core at the time of core collapse using both neutrinos and gravitational waves. Um, we can also learn about compact ob object formation and progenitor masses. So both getting masses of the protein trust star and the black hole, uh, and also learning about the protein trust star mass before fallback accretion. So how that protein neutron star mass evolves with time, and what is the role of fallback accretion in the supernova environment. Um, and we can also learn about explodability in this sort of fundamental sense, where I've told you not to believe any of these um, simulations, so observations of nearby supernovae can, can help pin down which one of these is doing the best job, um, and whether or not our star explodes or doesn't. Um, and finally, we can learn things about neutrino flavor oscillations or maybe dark matter phenomena as well uh, by comparing neutrino spectra uh, with what we observe um, and what we predict to come out of the, the supernova. Uh, so thank you all for listening. I'm happy to take questions. So how much do we bump up this rate when you are now sensitive to failed supernovae? Not a lot. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so it's not just this, it's also how well we'll let yeah. it Okay. Um, so if you think about like folding, this is the optimistic case. I should go back to the more realistic. Uh, uh, where was it? Um, yeah, so here, if you think about like folding in these with an IMF, um, we're all predicting the low mass stuff explodes, right? And sometimes out to about 20 solar masses. Um, so if you're, you're waiting for a failed supernova at 20 plus solar masses, it's going to be a while just because of, of IMF effects. Yeah. Too bad. Yeah. <laughs> So even if you, if you didn't see any supernova, and no, no, uh, and not even the alpha bomb, you can still look for the rate. Thank you. Okay, Elisa and then Chris. So you're talking about like what we can learn from nearby core collapse supernova. How nearby is nearby? Like, so I'm assuming as you, we wait for more observational capabilities, we can get better. <laughs> so yeah. like distance-wise, say that like the awesome telescopes we have today, how nearby is nearby? Uh, so all the neutrino stuff I showed for this was 10 kiloparsecs. We can push that out a little bit. That's pretty optimistic. So like uh, the neutrino detectors can still do a pretty good job uh, further out than that. Um, and with next generation detectors as well, so hypercomio Conde is an order, order of magnitude bigger than super Conde, so then that's even better. So we can start pushing out much further with the neutrinos. The gravitational waves are what is holding us back. <laughs> It's a really good question. Um, we're blowing up our stars in entirely different ways. Um, so Suckbold and Woosley, they carve out the central core of the star, so they don't model the protein neutron star at all, and they set an inner boundary to just emit neutrinos at some rate that they expect to be kind of realistic in order to blow up the star. Um, so they're not actually modeling the protein neutron star at all. They're sort of faking their neutrino emission and, and using that as a dial. To, to blow up their stars. The way we do it is we're, we're basically using an extension of mixing length theory to model the effects of turbulence and convection. Um, so we model the protein neutron star, we model the neutrino physics and the neutrino emission from first principles, um, and then sort of model the effects of convection in the system as well. Are you including the density shifts that take place when different Yes. Yeah. Are you including the Yeah, you can see that in there as well, yeah. yeah. And um, I haven't done that directly yet. So, so your it's error bars and the mass really are for specific equation of state. Yeah, so these are for a specific equation of state, but the error bars aren't going to be huge for equation of state. It's less sensitive than you think it is. Um, so there's going to be some fine tuning in the number of neutrino counts and gravitational wave emission, um, but it's not going to be a drastically different behavior for equation of state. Um, yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, but the equations of state aren't so dramatically different that they'll change that physics too drastically. That's fair. If you go into something dramatic with phase transitions, sure. <laughs> we'll 
Well, sticking to the reasonable stuff. <laughs> Okay, any more questions? If not, let's find the country again.